Brothers and sisters, we welcome you this evening to our 2018 annual Neil A. Maxwell Lecture, sponsored by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. My name is Spencer Fluman, and I'm the executive director of the Institute, and give to each of you a, well, a warm welcome to be with us here tonight. We recognize uh, presiding and speaking this evening Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Also to recognize on the stand is Sister, Hall, Sister Patricia Holland, uh, Academic Vice President James Rasband and his wife Mary, Associate Academic Vice President at BYU Brad Niger and his wife Sherry, uh, my wife Holly, and others uh, on the stand who I'll introduce as they have a part in our program in, with both prayer and song. We're going to begin this uh, event tonight with an opening prayer to be given by Dr. Deidre Nicole Green, a postdoctoral fellow at the Maxwell Institute. Immediately following her prayer, we'll have a special musical number, More Holiness Give Me, performed by Melinda Semadeni from Farmington, Utah, who works on campus as Assistant Dean of External Relations in BYU's College of Fine Arts and Communications. She'll be accompanied by Heidi Vogler, a PhD student in counseling psychology from Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Green. Our Father, we are so grateful to be gathered here tonight to celebrate um, the Maxwell Institute um, at this annual lecture. We are grateful for the example of our namesake, Elder Neil A. Maxwell, and his life of devotion and discipleship. We're grateful for the encouragement that he gave members of the church not to be intellectually lazy. And we pray as we listen to Elder Holland speak tonight about where religious scholarship should be going in the 21st century. That we will remember that example and think about what it means to consecrate the life of the mind and the intellect and make it a part of the life of discipleship. We pray that thy spirit will be here throughout this night, that Elder Holland will speak by the spirit and that we will receive by the spirit. We ask that we each may individually be inspired to see how we can build the church. We ask that those who feel alienated and ostracized may, through our efforts, feel that the kingdom of God is large enough and welcoming enough for all. We pray that our efforts also will help to build peace within the church and with institutions and other religious groups in society. And we pray that that will inspire us as to how we can better ensure that all our works are praised. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, holy. 
in the Lord, more pride in his glory, more hope in his word, more tears for his sorrows, more pain at his grief. strength to overcome, more freedom from her stains, more longing for home, more fit for the King. Thank you, Sister Vogler, Sister Semadeni, and uh, Dr. Green for setting a, a beautiful tone for this, uh, this wonderful evening together. It falls to me to introduce our speaker. I have it on good authority that Elder Holland prefer, prefers very short introductions. So by way of introduction, I'll share just a bit of an email from my daughter. Sister Savannah Fluman is serving in the Houston, Texas East Mission. Elder Holland came and spoke in her mission two weeks ago. On our, well, a little bit, a month ago. Dated 15 October 2018, Dad. Quote, Elder Holland came and yelled, us, yelled at us with the spirit as he does. It was so amazing. It lit a new fire under all of us, and it's so awesome. I love Elder Holland. He brought the most spiritual power I've ever felt in my life. It was so awesome. End of quote, and end of email. <laughs> we walk a... Uh, we walk a careful road at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. We are very aware of our namesake and of the sacred charge to us uh, to learn by study and also by faith and to build up the kingdom of God uh, on, on the earth. And in every prayer we offer at the Institute, we seek that space where the life of the mind and the life of the soul come together to build the kingdom. Elder Holland, uh, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the fire from heaven and for the awesome, and you can yell at us in, with the spirit anytime. We are grateful to hear from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. <clears throat> Thank you.
thank you, Spencer, very much. We, uh, we claim Spencer in our household, and I'm uh, grateful for what he's doing, and I'm grateful for the hospitality tonight. I, uh, I'm actually uh, a, a little uh, startled when I look at you and think of this tonight and uh, have a sort of a chilling uh, feeling that you may be, I don't know whether you are or not, but you may be like the sophomore who uh, charged into class, first lecture of the semester, uh, barely got in his seat, and the uh, professor said, uh, well, get ready, because today uh, we're going to talk about a kid who came home from college and found that his uncle had murdered his dad and married his mother and he in distress fell in love with a girl who inadvertently murdered her dad and then she went crazy and drowned herself and you retreated, he retreated to talk to ghosts and speak to a human skull that he named and thought about his own suicide. <laughs> well, the kid no sooner sat down than he got back up and he says, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I, I got enough problems of my own. I came to hear a lecture on Elizabethan literature. Uh, I, I am not sure what you came to hear tonight, uh, but I hope there's something in it uh, for everybody. I, I fear that the chill I have is that with the title, perhaps you anticipated a wonderful cruise through the 21st century countryside with no less a narrator than Elder Neal A. Maxwell with all his alliterative skill. Um, actually, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the bus that we have in for a lube and an oil job so that you can enjoy that trip uh, even more. I hope uh, when I'm through there will have been a little bit in this uh, for everybody and uh, that you will be rewarded for your wonderful, wonderful, thoughtful participation and hospitality tonight. Needless to say, uh, I'm more than honored, Pat with me, uh, to be back on this campus and to address you tonight for any reason on any subject. Uh, I love you. I love this university. I love Elder Neal A. Maxwell. His impact on my professional life has been immense. Uh, but in recent years, it's his apostolic life that I revere so much, and I think that will be evident in what I have chosen to say tonight and maybe how I've chosen to say it. I started preparing on this with Professor Fluman's kind invitation really months ago. I started preparing for this talk in a pretty standard way uh, that you might on a university with a, a religious heritage and an academic mission. I was reflecting on the collective duty to learn even by study and by faith, the very phrase that, that Elder Brother Fluman used, and, and then noting that the Alt Lord has always required the heart and a willing mind. I read a sheaf of educational materials, staggering amount. I wanted to reflect and remember and renew a lot of them Elder Maxwell's, but a lot of others. And I mused over some of the issues we wrestled with when I was here at the university a few years ago. I even recalled dim, distant memories of my graduate work in fields not completely foreign to elements of the Maxwell Institute. But it was soon clear to me that these were not the matters I was to pursue. And that was a, an interesting experience and uh, something of a wrestle before the Lord, as Enos said. What I realized uh, eventually is that while so many of the issues in academia had not changed much, all the things that I'd gone back to reflect about, 
I had changed. And so, with the humility incumbent upon anyone making such an assertion, I come tonight in my true identity as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask for your prayers in making me equal to that responsibility, because that is a greater responsibility than to simply come and give a, uh, an academic message per se. As I begin, I offer four caveats, brief as they are. First, although I accept sole responsibility for all inadequacies, limitations, errors, missed opportunities in this message, I'm here not only with the blessing, but also the rather explicit expectation of the officers of the university's board, whose executive committee I chair. In that sense, I speak for all of our governing advisors, uh, not just for myself. The second, because this lecture series is established as a tribute to Elder Maxwell, I've drawn heavily on his views of our challenges and our opportunities. Dealing with the limits of time, I've not been able to use much of the magnificent material available from the pen or the pulpit of other church leaders. I've read so much of that again recently, but haven't been able to use it in the time we have. Fortunately, Elder Maxwell's voice and teachings represent those other leaders wonderfully, wonderfully well. Third, I'm speaking really specifically to the Maxwell Institute tonight and not to the whole of BYU's academic effort, but I hope that much of what I say will apply not only across the campus but, uh, but beyond and out into the church. Last, I come with love appreciation, admiration, applause for every good thing you have ever done collectively here. Everything you're now doing, and as our title suggests, yet will do to seek the truth, build the faith, illuminate the majesty of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. For so much good being done by so many for so long, and who yet want to do more, I say thank you for the gift of your heart, might, mind, and strength. One could hardly give more. May I also offer a line or two of tribute to our honoree. And I am conscious that we're here with the wonderful Maxwell family whom I love dearly, individually and collectively. I first heard of Neil Maxwell, or more properly read of him, in June of 1971. My source was the church news, an unerring link at that time between New Haven, Connecticut and the Great Basin West. He had just been appointed commissioner of the church's educational system, and I was very impressed. Several years later, that's the very picture that I saw in the paper. Several years later, with my dissertation moving along and decisions arising, such as, after this degree, what? I called Elder Maxwell for advice. As I look back on it, it was a silly, embarrassing thing to do. Some insipid graduate student that Brother Maxwell had never met, asking via a telephone call what he should be when he grew up. <laughs> but Commissioner Maxwell could not have been more gracious in his manner nor more generous with his time. That phone call started a professional, then a personal, and then an apostolic friendship that will continue warmly and wonderfully forever. Suffice it to say that second only to some very profound experiences in prayer in New Haven, the fact that I would pursue a teaching career in the institute program of the church, clearly the least exciting and least Ivy League-like choice available to me, was due in large measure to that and subsequent conversations with Neil A. Maxwell. My life since then continues to have his fingerprints all over it. I take precious time to mention this personal relationship with Elder Maxwell for a reason. It is to say what Professor Fluman just said, very clearly and at the outset, that I too care very much about the man we honor in this lecture series. 
I care about his name, about the life he lived, the legacy he left, and the legacy that will run on into the 21st century and beyond. In great measure, the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship will, for good or ill, be the means of communicating much of that legacy to an ever younger, ever newer generation in the church who never heard Elder Maxwell's voice, nor delighted in his prose, nor felt the fire of his faith. But more important than Neil's gifts and legacy are the gifts of the Savior of the world he loved, who stands above and behind the apostles and his church, including their work in the field of education. Brothers and sisters, we're at a moment in this church, his church, the Savior's church, when there is a demonstrable, near-tangible hastening of the work. These continue to be the latter days, with no one knowing when that last, last day is going to be. Nevertheless, we know the undeviating trajectory toward it began 198 years ago in a grove of trees near Palmyra, New York. Continuing revelation to prophets, seers, and revelators since that first great theophany to the prophet Joseph has stimulated significant developments down through the years, including in the present day. There will be more. On his recent trip through South America, President Russell M. Nelson said, and I quote, Your witnesses to the process of restoration. If you think the church has been fully restored, you're just seeing the beginning. There is much more to come. Wait till next year. And then the next year, eat your vitamin pills. Get your rest. It's going to be exciting. I'm not an apocalyptic person, and none of us should sit around waiting for extraterrestrial rapture. But we do stand unequivocally with those angelic beings in Acts 1 who said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. In what the ordinances and the scriptures call that day of the Lord Jesus Christ, I imagine not only the dramatic universal appearance of his light coming out of the east and his descent upon two Jerusalems, but I also imagine a more personal encounter, a solitary Christ standing at a solitary door, making a solitary knock. Whose door is this? To what chamber does it lead? I've always assumed it was the door of a home, mine and yours and everyone's. Perhaps it's more figuratively the door to each human heart. Tonight, I ask that we make it the door of the Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University and the academic world it hopes to influence. And what's the invitation? If any scholar hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him or her and will sup with him and he with me. The question for the Institute is the question eventually for all of us, all humankind. How do we best and most warmly open that door, personally and professionally, and on what do we sup when the Master is admitted? Will our time and conversation in the Maxwell Institute be consistent in every way with his gospel, his grace, his life, his loving, persistent plea to come follow me. You're probably thinking that this opening is a bit melodramatic for the purposes of this gathering, referencing the first vision, priesthood ordinances, the advent of the king, the significance of end times generally. I prefer to see it as apostolic. These are the topics that absorb 15 of us who toss and turn when we'd like to sleep and slumber. 
In that spirit, my friends, I can think of few other entities on this campus that have received the attention from the general officers of the church that the Maxwell Institute has, at least lately. I offer my non-campus-wide, non-Marriott Center appearance in this modest venue as evidence of that attention tonight. The Lord's prophet who chairs your board and his fellow apostles who sit with him sent me to you. We hope it is affirming for you to have that strong, active interest in you. At a time when the direction and the priorities of the church are being discussed as almost never before, at least certainly not as ever before in my lifetime of service. We hope you welcome that focused attention, that uh, you are as measured for your role in these developments. Can you blame us uh, for such eager interest? There are very few institutions, agencies, departments, functions, activities in this big, wonderful church that are looked to as representing its values and reflecting its virtues more than is Brigham Young University and the work that goes on here. BYU is an asset to be envied by every educational sponsor in this world, certainly by any other church sponsoring a university in this world. This university was a life changer for me. Maybe it is or was for you. I say there's nothing like it anywhere. Of course, the mission of the church and the mission of BYU are not identical, but their missions certainly can never ever be at odds with each other. And in the case of the Maxwell Institute, they must come as close together as an ecclesiastical sponsor and an academic recipient of that sponsorship can be. So, if the university is to reflect the best the church has to offer by way of a world-class academic endeavor, no apologies to anyone, then the Neil A. Maxwell Institute must see itself as at least among the best the university has to offer as a faithful, rich, rewarding center of faith-promoting gospel scholarship enlivened by remarkable disciple scholars. Of our commitment to seek learning generally, Elder Maxwell said, there is as much vastness in the theology of the restoration as in the stretching universe. There is space there for the full intellectual stretching of any serious disciple. There is room enough and to spare for all the behavioral development one is willing to undertake. But in the search for truth, not all truths are of equal importance. And in using the disciple-scholar metaphor, that hyphenated noun, Elder Maxwell left us as part of his marvelous linguistic legacy, the spiritual half of that union was always the more important, and you know that. Though I have spoken of the disciple scholar, he said, in the end, all the hyphenated words come off. In the end, we're finally disciples, men and women of Christ. But the wonderful thing with Neil, and the thing I want for us, is that it didn't have to come down to a choice between intellect and spirit. In a consecrated soul, and consecration was one of his favorite doctrinal concepts, in a consecrated soul they would be aligned beautifully, a perfect fit, a precise overlay. But if it did come down to a choice, it would be faith, the yearning, burning commitment of the soul that would always matter most in the end. Regarding that faith-filled scholarship of which Elder Maxwell speaks, may I note plainly one thing, the one thing we expect you, among other things, to do that is central to your raison d'etre. It is to undergird and inform the pledge 
Elder Maxwell made when he said of uncontested criticism, no more slam dunks. We ask you as part of a larger game plan to always keep a scholarly hand fully in the face of those who oppose us. As a ne'er-do-well athlete of yesteryear, I was always told, you play offense for the crowd, you play defense for the coach. Your coaches will be very happy to have you play both superbly well. About four years ago, at the university's invitation, three outside scholars reviewed the circumstances the Institute was then facing and wrote 19 pages of observations. Some of what they said addressed the matter of apologetics broadly defined. Whatever else they had in mind, I thought it a marvelous understatement for them to have said, there will be times when our faith will require an explicit defense. We want the Maxwell Institute and many others to contribute to that defense with solid, reputable scholarship, intended as much for everyday garden variety Latter-day Saints who want their faith bolstered, at least as much as might be intended for disinterested academic colleagues across the country whose stated purpose will never be to prove or disprove the truth claims of the church. Whichever audience we address at any given moment, I note the advice of the review team who challenged the Institute to, quote, promulgate a clear statement of its commitment to engage in work that builds the kingdom, to set the agenda according to their own objectives and not those of the academy, and to ensure that the dominant tone of their journals and books affirm core LDS values as outlined in the foundational documents of BYU. Obviously, that agenda spoken of must always include work done on the foundational documents of the kingdom as well, the Restoration Scriptures and especially the Book of Mormon. It may have been in this regard that the reviewers said the current culture at Maxwell Institute may have lost some of the Institute's founding vision and original purpose. Now, as I quickly step from one landmine to another, <laughs> le let me say something about what was heretofore called Mormon studies at BYU. Obviously, you're going to have to find another name <laughs> for that part of your endeavor. Take heart, take heart. We're going through the same exercise at church headquarters, <laughs> addressing a whole host of adjustments that are necessary in our own departments, our own printed materials, public communications. We know this assignment will give you heartburn, but it doesn't rank with the Missouri persecution, so dive in. Uh, <laughs> to his counselors and to, the use, to us in the Quorum of the Twelve, President Russell M. Nelson said of this matter, while acknowledging we have no control over what other people may call us, we cannot call ourselves by any other than the name the Lord has prescribed. To the degree that we tolerate our own use of Mormon or Mormonism, he continued, we'll be held accountable for this error in nomenclature. To a public audience just weeks ago, he said, the name of the church is not negotiable. So, dear friends, when coming from our own tongues, the use of Mormonism is anathema, and so is Mormon, if it pertains to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a title per se. President Nelson understands fully that renaming Mormon studies is a concern. He wrote to me, he was concerned enough to write to me uh, an email uh, and said, and I quote, Part of the challenge at the Maxwell Institute will it be its identity, never more obvious than in the subset titled Mormon Studies. Is this an institute for studies of the Book of Mormon or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the restoration of the gospel? We need to help. We need to help them know who they are and why they exist. He continued, I truly believe that if they can claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, some way in their name, the Lord will bless them in their mission, close quote. It's a very private email, but he gave me permission to share it. Having dealt with at least that elephant in the room, 
an elephant now lying in an ungainly heap in the middle of the floor. <laughs> it's up to you marvelous folks to figure out how to get it out of the house. <laughs> we will be praying for you <laughs> right after using the same equipment at church headquarters. <laughs> we'll loan you the front end loader that you may need to wrestle with this. But as with all such challenges in gospel life, I see the requirement to adjust our name as being a blessing not in disguise. A unique name, somehow, reflecting language given by the Savior himself, will be one way of sending a signal that we are different, sometimes a lot different, out here in Provo, Utah. Of necessity, we will often be a peculiar people in the academy as well as in other arenas of life. In the spirit of full disclosure, you should know that initially I was against any proposal to do at BYU, what was called Mormon Studies Elsewhere, because I knew what Mormon Studies Elsewhere generally meant in the public eye. However, over time, I see the merit in a Latter-day Saint Studies effort at BYU if you are willing to make it significantly different from the present national pattern. If you're willing to be truly unique I can endorse the idea that BYU should have a hand on any academic tiller dealing with the church, becoming a place to which other such programs and chairs and lectureships might look for leadership. If, as is often the case, some journalist or researcher or interested layman wanted to know more about the church from an academic source, I would not want them to think of any other voice anywhere more readily than they would think of Brigham Young University. But that leadership role cannot be successfully played in an entirely traditional Mormon Studies framework. I say this because Mormon Studies programs, and I continue to use the word because we have it for now, these programs on other campuses are designed to be primarily academic ventures, not spiritual ones which is perfectly understandable. Some of our member students enroll in those programs, and it may be a faith-promoting experience, but in great measure, these endeavors are oriented toward an audience not of our faith. So be it, and not necessarily for faith-building purposes. One such program proclaims that it, quote, does not promote or reject any particular religion. End quote. Another says it promotes understanding of the church without necessarily advancing or disputing the veracity of its faith claims. End of quote. One describes their work principally as engaging in Mormonism both as a significant cultural fact and as a research subject. Close quote. They are, for the most part, a way for other people to look at us making no particular call upon one's belief and having no particular covenantal consequence after the course is over or the essay is written or the seminar has ended. I understand all of that. These programs may indeed, yes, provide a thoughtful consideration of the Restoration's distinctive culture and convictions. Yes, it may offer the richness and intellectual substance and relevance to other religious traditions and its people's historic resilience. These do have value and undoubtedly lift the church out of the dismissed, unexamined space to which it has been relegated by so many for so long. Perhaps that is enough elsewhere and we should leave it at that. But I would be the first to oppose such an effort on this campus if all it meant was a thoughtful exploration of our religion's richness or its intellectual substance or its historic resilience, that would be what your review team called a secular premise which Latter-day Saints will find philosophically troubling. Certainly, your trustees would find it troubling. Now, take a deep breath. Smile. I am not suggesting our BYU approach to scholarly dialogue 
has to start with slides of your mission uh, or end with an anthem from the Tabernacle Choir on Temple Square, notice the modified name. <laughs> but any scholarly endeavor at BYU and certainly anything coming under the rubric of the Maxwell Institute must never principally be characterized by stowing one's faith in a locker while we have a great exchange with those not of our faith. Neil Maxwell phrased it this way, a few hold back a portion of themselves merely to please a particular gallery of peers. Some hold back by not appearing overly committed to the kingdom, lest they incur the disapproval of particular peers who might disdain such consecration. And some just hold back, period. Bracketing your faith is what those in the field call it. This is not an entirely simple issue because bracketing a hostile or aggressively biased faith can be a protection against abuse. Nevertheless, as John Levinson wrote 25 years ago for his own significant Jewish reasons, bracketing one's faith has more limitations than virtues. Above all, it precludes sharing insights truly unique to one's faith thereby missing the opportunity to, to enrich the other. In Levinson's mind, there's a difference between common ground and neutral ground. He feels that a position which studiously pursues strict neutrality by bracketing will miss the chance for genuine, even profound dialogue on matters of common interest. On this, I stand personally with Levinson and Stephen Prothrow, who's recently become a friend. Stephen said 15 years ago that bracketing one's personal faith, its truth claims, if you will, and moral judgments has cost scholars credibility with some readers because, as he says, no one knows exactly where those authors are coming from ideologically. Elder Maxwell was more direct. He said we're not really learned if we exclude the body of divine data that the eternities place at our disposal through revelation and the prophets of God. He also said the highest education, therefore, includes salvational truths. Thus, the invitation to include in your scholarly backpack the body of divine data that the eternities have placed at our disposal. We are to use salvational truths whenever and wherever we can. Now, brothers and sisters and friends, one and all, and beyond this room and out onto the campus, wherever, we know that you want and are trying to get this right. Professor Fluman, whom I love as a son, phrased your intentions this way. He said, and I quote, the Maxwell Institute's mission is unique because though it is grounded in the most rigorous scholarly standards, it explicitly acknowledges a Latter-day Saint faith audience, identity, and commitment. Because we pursue scholarship as a dimension of discipleship, we offer a fundamentally different approach to the study of our own faith and the study of religion generally." Close quote. That seems wonderfully consistent with your external review team's counsel those four years or so ago that the Institute should create an environment where faith can be nurtured and the restoration defended. And all of this accomplished with the highest scholarly standards. <coughs> Professor Fluman and all. If those marvelous characterizations rightly state the clear and indeflectible direction of the Maxwell Institute, your trustees will enthusiastically and devotedly support you and the university administration in following that course to great success. I've already stressed why this makes you fundamentally different in the world of academic studies of the church. But that difference fires the imagination, frankly, for me, 
With the emergence of these programs on other campuses, what if we seized the opportunity, really seized it, to act more and be acted upon less? Could we not assert ourselves on the agenda and place there some topics on which we have a unique opportunity to contribute? Not neutral ground, but we hope maybe common ground or uncommon ground. For one very homely example, I remember from my own stillborn work studying American religious development that there was in early America a lot of interest in family life, in kinship, in colonial family lines back to England and Europe, efforts to understand any way they could those early Americans who were so devotedly on God's errand into the wilderness. Are we bold enough in a BYU-based program to go into the fray saying that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has something to contribute regarding ancestral lines, family heritage, family histories, personal histories, personal journals, especially women's journals, and so forth. Furthermore, what about introducing our academic friends to the idea that salvific work can be done for family members who are deceased? I insert that last line just to see if you're still listening. I know you can't hold a Mormon Studies seminar at Berkeley on the beauty of the temple endowment, something someone not of our faith would not have experienced. But we could certainly stimulate a lot of response from virtually anyone with the suggesting that saving sacral ordinances can be efficaciously performed for one's kindred dead. And if such doctrinal topics are too problematic for them, what about simply the current interest in sacred space generally? Might we have something to say to our colleagues that would let us elaborate on the significance of holy space in our history and in our thought? And we've only begun to mine the wonders of the Joseph Smith papers. How do we get those gems out to those not of our faith and get them out without compromising their unique Latter-day Saint characteristics? Positionality, I am told, is a catchy academic buzzword at the moment. I am simply inviting us to capitalize on our positionality, to share what we may take for granted, but which others might see as true jewels in the Latter-day Saint crown. I hasten to say that some of you are already doing this very thing and have done it for a long time, and it is delightful to see. Friends, what we're asking you to do is difficult. It is demanding. It is among the stiffest challenges we could give you. We know you can't be credible in every circle if you're seen as lacking scholarly substance and categorically defensive all the time. But neither can you afford to ever be perceived as failing to serve the larger faith-oriented purposes of this church. All we can ask is that you pray and fast and strive and sweat to find your way through. And then if there be error, let it be on the side of your covenants and on the side of your faith convictions. I promise the board won't return in five years or ever and come down on you saying that you made a mistake in doing so. As your visiting reviewers said, to satisfy academic standards of excellence and appropriate tone on the one hand and to sustain and defend the kingdom on the other will be one of the Maxwell Institute's greatest challenges in the years to come. It will require constant vigilance and ongoing negotiation to find and keep that balance. One way to keep that balance, and I stress this, one way to keep that balance is to remember that the Maxwell Institute and its heretofore called Mormon Studies program can never be synonymous to
terms. The Maxwell Institute may include Mormon studies, albeit one determinedly unique in its nature, but the larger institute title cannot be simply an alternate designation for its subset program out to an essentially wider academic non-Latter-day Saint world. No, as a crowd who invites others to study us, even as we study ourselves, and who speaks to the faithful every bit as much as to the detached, you'll have to be comfortable being oddballs in what you're going to speak to both groups. It will usually not be in the same documents, probably not with the same vocabulary, and seldom, I would guess, in the same venue. But both the believers and the merely curious need to be able to see you as a source for some of the answers to their questions, however different that source material may be. And yes, if after such a balancing act, theological warfare still comes, you'll have to be willing to take sides. To reassure those I have made uncomfortable, I quote my favorite Scottish pastor who had such an influence on C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity, said George MacDonald, is every Christian expected to bear witness? And please read the gender equality into this. A man content to bear no witness to the truth is not of the kingdom of heaven. One who believes must bear witness. One who sees the truth must live witnessing to it. Is our life then a witnessing to the truth? Do we carry ourselves in the bank, on the farm, in the house or shop, in the study or chamber or workshop, or the academy, as the Lord would or as the Lord would not? Are we careful to be true? When contempt is cast on the truth, do we smile? Wronged in our presence, do we make no sign that we hold by it? I do not say, MacDonald goes on, that we're called upon to dispute and defend with logic and argument, but we are called upon to show that we're on the other side. The soul that loves the truth and tries to be true will know when to speak and when to be silent. But the true man or woman will never look as if they did not care. We are not bound to say all we think. But we are bound not to even look like what we do not think. I highlight the line about not being bound to say all you think, about knowing when to speak and when to be silent. If invited to speak to a medical convention, his physician peers, should he ever have time or inclination to do that, which he doesn't, President Nelson would obviously not say everything he might say in a general conference address. Those are two different audiences with two different purposes. In that spirit, we know that not every seminar you hold in the academic world will be a formal first lesson from Preach My Gospel nor will every essay you produce be submitted to the ensign for the entire church to savor, more's the pity. But by definition, your work will be broad and creative, pursued for a variety of purposes and addressed to differing audiences. No, I echo MacDonald's insistence that while we're not obligated to declare everything we believe at any given time in any one setting, we are also not to even look like what we do not believe. The soul that loves the truth and tries to be true will know when to speak and when to be silent. But the true man or woman will never look as if they did not care. <sighs> beloved, beloved colleagues, if we do our work well today, 
we can make things better for those who will come in troubled times ahead. Those prophesied times before that day when Christ himself will rule and reign. That eschatological moment against which I increasingly measure both my own personal worthiness and that of the church generally. In that regard, we all need to do what we can in the hour we've been given, acknowledging, as the later Nephi did, that these are our days. As Elder Maxwell once quoted J.R.R. Tolkien's Gandalf, it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. That piece, ironically, it strikes me as from the return of the king. We in this room tonight are tilling cleaner earth because Elder Neil Maxwell and his earlier apostolic associates have tried to counter evil and error in every field in which they found it. Some of the weather in which they worked was stormy indeed, fatal on more than one occasion. Some of the weather ahead will be equally so for our children. Thank you in advance for helping the saints of the 21st century navigate those gales successfully. Let me close in tribute to Elder Maxwell when this institute was created. President Dallin H. Oaks, former president of the university and currently first vice chairman of the BYU Board of Trustees said, this institute belongs to God. It must pursue an unconditional commitment to his cause without any obsessions or any cultivation of cheering constituencies. The work of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship must be genuine and pervasive, as broad as the spiritual interests of the children of God, as faithful as eternal truth, and as bright as the light of truth that is in us. In speaking of such a great work, as broad and faithful and bright as President Oaks here declares, I have certainly not wanted, as Mormon once wrote to his son, to weigh thee down tonight. I have rather very much wanted Christ to lift us up to the majesty of the moment we are in, the real purpose of Mormon's letter to his son. I testify that Jesus is the Christ the great cornerstone of this, his earthly kingdom in the making. I testify that he loves you for every good thing you have ever done to help and every way you're trying to help now. I also testify that from time to time, he will patiently nudge all of us, giving course correction regarding anything that doesn't help. With his love and holy guidance, I know that you will be successful in your mission with the clarion call of the disciple scholar's trumpet giving an unequivocally certain sound. For that sound we pray and wait in the name of whose work this is, whose church this is, and whose witnesses you and I are at all times and in all things and in all places that we may be in. I testify of him, Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end of everything, even the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
Our closing prayer this evening will be given by Lilia Brown, a BYU student and employee at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute from Lake Town, Utah. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we had tonight to hear from Elder Holland, and we're grateful for um, we're grateful for his preparation and the thought that he put into this lecture, and for the spirit that we felt as as we were here listening. And we pray that Thou will help us to apply what. Um, what we felt prompted by the Spirit to change in our lives. Uh, we pray that thou will help us to be better representatives of thy Son and that we may be able to recognize how we can more clearly um, defend our convictions. Um, we are so grateful to thee, Father, and we're grateful for this university and for the, the Maxwell Institute and we pray that thou wilt continue to inspire uh, the leaders of the Institute and of, of uh, BYU um, and also of, of this church. And we pray that thou wilt continue to sustain uh, our leaders, including Elder Holland and also President Nelson, and continue to guide them. And we're so grateful to have the gospel in our lives and to have a knowledge of the end of thy son and his atonement for us. And we again just pray that thou wilt help us to recognize what we can do to more firmly follow thee in thy son and show our love for thee. And we pray in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.